Welcome, everyone. We have a really interesting episode coming up as we are dis- discussing the physical activity paradox with the very expert of the team. Before I introduce our guest, I wanted to highlight a comment from our listener. Laura Williams was saying in Twitter that podcasts are my favorite evening activity, finding it incredibly helpful to listen to researchers talk about their work. Thanks, Laura. Really nice to hear that you are finding value in the content. But to the today's guest, our guest has done his PhD at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He is working as a professor at the National Research, Cent- Research Center for the Working Environment in Copenhagen, Denmark. He has been involved in over 350 scientific papers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Professor Andreas Holterman. Welcome, Andreas. Thank you, Oli. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to the, the chat. Pleasure to have you. So if we start right away from the physical activity paradox, what what is physical activity paradox? Yeah, to me, I think it's paradox it's a paradox that physical activity not necessarily only is for the good, not necessarily only is promoting health, but physical activity can also either not be beneficial or potentially also be harmful. And I think, uh, at least for me, this, this is, it was something of a paradox after, you know, having the education and training and physical activity and exercise science, you know, right? Then you learn about, well, physical activity is one of the best investments you can do for your health. The more, mm. the better. Uh, and in that respect, I have, I think it's a paradox that it might actually not necessarily be good for all of us to do physical activity if it's, you know, if it's work-related and it's part of, you know, the doing the productive work for, for instance, for several hours. Mm. Yeah, so this is quite a simple question, but how come physical activity done on the free time is beneficial, but when you do it on the work time, it's maybe actually unhealthy for you. So could you explain in simple terms, where does the difference come from? Yeah, so I, I posed exactly the same questions question to myself when I started as a postdoc in Copenhagen. So my task was then to figure out how can it be that workers in occupational groups like, like cleaners, we started out with the cleaners, mm. uh, how can it be that they are so unfit they have so many health issues when they are ha- being so physically, highly physically active. And uh, we started out to do measurements on their physical activity during work. And we f- found out that, well, some of those, particularly those cleaning hospitals, they were actually walking 15 to 20,000 steps per day. But their mm. fitness level was much worse than for any occupation group, particularly office workers and other groups. We are doing much less degree of physical activity, and this was the uh, this was um, very. F- I, I found it very fascinating, but because these uh, these group of, of cleaners, they were my, uh, they were coming from non Danish backgrounds. Many of those having a, a, a non ethnical background, so they were not drinking, they were not smoking. You know, they they didn't have several of these lifestyle um, uh, issues. Which, um, which we normally would say was, would be the cause. So that was the starting point for me, figuring out how can it be that some of those in our society being the most physically active, how can it be that they are not in very good shape and fitness and health? And, mm. and then what was, was when we started out, figure out how can it be so? So we started out doing measurements with accelerometers and all this type of heart rate sensors to figure out what is it really, what's the difference when they are being physically active at the work compared to when, what we normally are measuring, right? People going for a brisk walk, for a run, for some sports during leisure time. Mm. And uh, what we found out then was, first of all, the dose was very, very different. They, they were often walking or doing some kind of work tasks 
for seven, eight hours in Denmark. And I know in other countries, mm. it can also be much more, many more hours compared to less time. You know, normally it's, I don't know, 30 minutes, one mm. hour, 90 minutes if you're playing soccer, you know, but not eight hours. That was one thing. The other thing that was that it was a very low, monotonous intensity, mm. you know? So the heart rate doesn't really come up to a level which we know is necessary to improve fitness. And we also could see that they had very short periods of, of breaks and rest periods compared to, to less time where we normally see, you know, if you're going for a run or playing soccer or basketball or something like that, you have higher levels, right, of, of heart mm. rate. So you get your heart rate up, you get the fitness benefit, and you often also have the breaks necessary, right, to recover. Mm. Um, and then another thing which we we uh, found was that we were monitoring uh, their uh, ambulatory blood pressure, mm. and then found that well, you know, for instance, the cleaners, but also very a lot of other uh, occupational groups, they are doing their upper body to do different tasks like cleaning the floors or whatever, right? Mm. And when you're doing that, your your blood pressure is is in, increased compared to while you're sitting. So what we found was that well, often you know they had a blood pressure level which were, was significantly elevated eight, nine hours, eight mm. to nine hours per day, right? And we didn't see any dip afterwards. You know, after, after you've been going for a run, then you have a post-exercise hypotension, right? So you, mm. you have a dip in your blood pressure afterwards. So if you're going for a run for 30 minutes, then you have, of course, you are having high blood pressure when you go for the run. But afterwards, you have a long period with lower uh, blood pressure. So in general, they had uh, they're having a elevated twenty four um, hour blood pressure, which we know is mm -hmm. a risk factor. And mm -hmm. the same thing is is respect to the heart rate. We find elevated heart rates, right? If you're doing mm -hmm. the, this type of work seven, eight, nine hours per day, um, then you also have that, which you also know is a risk factor. Um, and then it's also been some studies going showing that it seems like um, having this amount of occupational physical activity can be associated with increased levels of inflammation, which might also be because it's not necessary so that they get you know the the recovery period necessary, right? Mm -hmm. If you're having it, let's say that you are like a cleaner or construction worker, right? It's seven to eight hours every five days in a row, right? So mm. it's not necessary so that you are you are recovering in between. And lastly, and what I think is the most important thing is is the control. You know, during less time, often if you if you don't feel well, then most of us, you know, then, then we don't go for that run, right? Mm. Or we don't go that hard. But in work, right, then you don't you, you don't do the physical activity to for the well being. Or for for you know getting fitness, but you're doing it to generate a task which someone pays you for. So yeah. so it's the level of control is completely different. And what we see is particularly among those having really manual work, right? If you go on to the construction site or bricklayers and scaffolders and slaughterhouse workers, mm. it's not much control they have than themselves. It's it's the work pace is set by the production mm. right mm. so the level of control is so different so i think a lot of those you know all those things all i think in principle all those things we learn about exercise activity and health all those things we try to promote mm. in those settings most of the day they are not present mm. in occupational settings yeah so that's yeah. That's why. I, so that's what was how I started out, right? Doing, trying to investigate this, and and um, you know, and and what was fascinating was that some coming from my own field, physical activity and exercise science, they saw this as a paradox, right? Mm. It's paradoxical that not all physical activity necessarily is good, while others, those coming from the occupational health side, they said, Andreas, this is just foolish. It's not a paradox. We have always known. We have always known from uh, from the. I think some of the best studies are. They are actually from Finland, from the forest right. workers in Finland. They were yeah. doing, been doing excellent 
excellent work physiology studies in, in Finland showing that particularly if you are having, particularly, you know, in the, in the 60s, 70s, right, when it was really manual work to be a forest worker in Finland, mm -hmm. then they saw, they saw the, the, the issue, you know, of having a high manual job and not having the fitness levels necessary mm. to cope with that job. Mm. So this is, in principle, it's not new. It's just been that from the occupational side, right, from the occupational field, it's been something which have been, you know, it's just been seen as, as uh, this is the way it is. Manual mm. work is not healthy. But on the other hand, the, from, from our side, you know, physical activity and health side, then it's been physical activity is the best thing you can do. What, what are these guys talking about in the occupational mm. field, right? Yeah. So, so this is what is, is you know what, what has it been about about this paradox. And uh, then I I came as this postdoc uh, as my postdoc position. When is it? Fifteen years ago or something like that, right? Yeah. And 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 then I figured out, well, we need to we need to go further beyond just being religious about physical activity at work not necessarily be good or all physical mm. activities is being good. We need to make proper investigations and studies on this. So that's mm. that's what I've been doing for some years. Yeah, yeah, really, really interesting point. So you can have twenty thousand steps per day and have a bad fitness, maybe worse than someone who has just five thousand steps, which is pretty interesting. So you said that if the twenty-four hour heart rate is elevated, it's not good for your health. Do we know the mechanism? Why why is it that the heart is beating? Is it getting fatigued, or what's what's the reason for this? Yeah, so it's been it's been several suggestions. So it's been this uh, theory of atherosclerosis. It's been uh, been for for several decades. Been in general, being that if you are having a, a elevated um, stress levels in general. Uh, mm. It could both be mentally and can be physically, which is increasing your heart rate for a long period of time. Mm. Then you're you're getting some, you know, some elevated both hormonal uh, levels, but also you, you can have some long term effects, cardiovascular effects, which is not good for your system. Mm. Um, particularly if you're not are having the recovery needed, and if it's you know if and if if the stress levels. Are higher than what your your fitness levels and your resources can can handle. So mm. I, I think it's been very much this this type of, uh, and I think that's a you know that's a basic theory in, in stress theory, in physiological theory, homostasis theory, right? It, it is that if you have this sustained, elevated demands, it could be cardiovascular, it could be metabolic, it can be musculoskeletal. Mm. And you don't have the sufficient resources or recovery time, then you can have these type of um, effects. Uh, mm. And I think it's in general it's it's the same for mental loads, right? Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. But no one really truly knows. I, I yeah. don't think anyone. It, it, you know, it's it's just theories for for what, what the mechanism could be with respect to the heart rate. Yeah, and and you think that it's only if it's twenty four hour, it's all the time kind of elevated. But I think you measured just the average heart rate of the day, and if that's elevated, that's a risk factor. Is it this kind of findings? Yeah, so that's that's another thing which I think is really truly important. It, it is that uh, at least the studies I've done and others have done, which I've seen, right? They have just been measuring twenty four hour heart rate. Mm. They take the average. And then they see that those having an elevated heart rate over the 24-hour period, they have increased risk for heart disease and mortality, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, compared to those having a lower level. Yeah. Um, but I, I haven't really seen anyone investigating, well, it's not the average, which is really is, is, is the mechanism, I think. Mm. You know, I think it's really good to have, to have some higher periods, you know, where you stress the system, as long as you have the 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 recovery periods afterwards right mm. so so i think in principle i think uh, and that's also what we see in several of these occupational groups they are having um, they are having elevated heart rate because they are walking slowly or they are doing some standing while doing upper body work right which is increasing your heart rate but they don't mm. never get it really truly up mm. and then seldom really got it down 
while yeah. like me and you sitting here and uh, having this type of work, right? We are okay now. I'm talking a lot, so now my, my heart rate is a bit elevated. But normally now is is really is down, and then afterwards we go for a run or we have active commuting back home, or right, that, and then we get it up, right? So we yeah. get the sufficient amount of relaxation, but we also have the periods where we get it up, and I think that's that's really an imp- important part of understanding this because. What a lot of those um, people, when we talk, when we do interviews with them, they often say they are so fatigued. So mm. they don't have necessarily have the energy and they don't see the need for, you know, mm. going for a brisk walk or a run mm. because they have been active. They, of course, they are feeling fatigued. They've used the body for, for several hours per day. So, and, uh, and it's not, I think you, you need quite a lot of uh, knowledge to know that. Well, that type of activity gives something, might give some some different effects than going for strength exercises or mm. other type of exercise during leisure time. So, yeah, yeah. So, do do you think there's a tendency like that? You know, heart rate. It's good that it goes up pretty high, and then you have it lower. For example, heat exposure like sauna. It's good that you are in a really hot sauna for twenty minutes and then it's not. But if you are whole day warm, it's not good for you. I think same goes for inflammation. If you do strength training, you get inflammation, but it's kind of protecting you from the low grade inflammation. So I see a quite a bit of tendency with blood pressure also that you want to have high stimuli, but not like constant almost whatever exposure it is for the body. Yeah, so so before I came started to work with the occupational health field, I was working with uh, with uh, top athletes, skier, cross country skiers and others really top athletes in Norway. Um, mm. and you know, it's in principle it's the same principle, right? It's really good to put on as much as really high doses stimuli on the body, as long as the body is able to to cope with that, you know, mm. and adapt to that, and it is to find exactly that s- sweet spot is what is I think is, that's truly the essence of sports performance, mm. right? But in an occupational, uh, and I, I and I think in in general in the general population, respect to sports and leisure time physical activity, we are doing our body tells us when to stop. Our bodies tell you start to get a bit, you know, uh, bit pain or, you know, fatigued. And then you just stop, you know, and you take a rest the next day. Mm. But that's, I think that's one of the issues in, in uh, respect to occupational physical activity that it's no one, you don't have a coach there saying, now we should find a sweet spot. We should figure out exactly what you, which type of stimuli, which is good for you and make sure that you have the recovery. Mm. You don't have that. Or you are not necessarily able to listen to your body and say, well, now I'm actually lifted 500 boxes over mm. these three, uh, three hours. I'm completely fatigued. You're not necessarily able to just listen to your body then and say, well, I take the rest of the day off. Mm. So I think that's, that's a crucial part, uh, difference, I think. And, uh, but of course, then we, it's also complicated stuff because then we cannot... But I think it's very much the same in, uh, than in as in uh, exercise science that we cannot ne- necessarily say that this is the best because mm. it depends on the on the individual, right? So that's why why we always try to optimize what's best for the individual. In the same with respect to work, we know that someone really have the capacity and the rec- recovery capacity to handle extreme doses of manual work. While mm. others are far from there, right? Mm. Uh, so it's very hard to say when is something becoming healthy and when is this, uh, when it might be un- unhealthy. Yeah. So would you have any rule of thumb that, for example, if, if if we think like construction work, which is like you would be building pipes up there, you would be having doing overhead work, it would be physical. Would you recommend for them to also exercise? Or then if it's like, a, let's say, cleaning work, which is probably a little bit less physical, but constant load, would you recommend them to exercise and what kind of exercise and how would they actually listen to the body because they feel all the time tired, basically? Yeah. 
So if we just go on with the with the cleaners, right? Yeah. Uh, so what we did after we we uh, did these measurements with the cleaners, we set up a randomized control trial, and uh, we tested exactly can we then make uh, a work site uh, one hour per week uh, aerobic exercise. Uh, so uh, it it was. Uh, doing aerobics, uh, brisk walking, running, these type of activities uh, for the cleaners. So they did it during their, their, uh, their working hours. And then we found incredible increases in fitness levels, in inflammation levels, in pain levels, you name it. We found so many beneficial effects. And this was, just imagine, so this was a group of, of people who are having seven to eight hours manual work every day. Of mm -hmm. course, they are very sedentary during leisure, but at least they're doing seven to eight hours every day. Then we put one hour of, of physical activity, which is exercise in principle, right? Mm -hmm. Leisure time, physical activity characteristics, high intensity, right? And they get massive improvements. So I think this just tells that... that uh, for several of these groups, it can be really uh, beneficial to have some health-promoting physical activity. And what we also found for these cleaners, and I think that's one of the only studies in the world which has actually shown it, is that because they've increased their fitness levels, their heart rate levels, we measured 24-hour heart rates mm -hmm. before and after intervention, was lower. They were doing the same work tasks with a lower heart rate. So the loading on their body was lower which then, you know, put less demand on the recovery and so on. So we found so many beneficial effects. And this we, we have done for a lot of different occupa manual occupation groups. For instance, mm. some of my colleagues, uh, so one, uh, we've done it in construction workers, uh, we found positive effects. We have done it in elder care. We have done it in, some of my colleagues actually did it in slaughterhouse workers. You know, uh, being mm. having some of the most demanding uh, work tasks, I would say, uh, particularly for the upper body, right? And uh, my colleagues then made um, exercises with elastic bands and found really good effects on reducing uh, self-reported pain levels and improved mm. function. Um, and it just shows that if the physical activity is really tailored to the work, and really provides, you know, the capacity, builds capacity, mm. and and what they need, I think, is really good. But I think it's a really, really important part because this is the first question I get: Can't we just offer these people, or say that they should do in their leisure time, exercises? Mm. But what I've seen after I've been working now with these type of groups in fifteen years is that. Even though we have been to several of these, these um, workplaces, found really, really good effects, often they stop. Mm -hmm. And it can be because, you know, it can be always if it's in the working hours, it, it has some cost, right? Someone mm -hmm. needs to pay that. Or that it might be that the workers think it's too stressful because they have so many different, uh, you know, work mm -hmm. tasks, so it's fine hard, hard to do it, even though the manager says that you should do it. And in the end, unfortunately, we see that so many of these um, these workers, they don't have the resources. They're mm. too fatigued to really do exercises after this type of work. And um, I'm coming from a small fishing village up in northern Norway. So I've, I've been trying to having this type of fishing, lifting fishing boxes. Mm. And I was 18 years old and was really well trained at that point of time. And then I, I really had problems to do the, you know, the, the running and the soccer playing and all these type of things when coming ho home from that type of work, right? I was just mm. completely fatigued. Mm. So, so, I think that's, so I think that's really hard. So what we are doing now is that we, we are rather turning the coin and thinking about these people, they are, they are having a manual job. Being physically act active, and it's it's not you know it's it's if we can try to design the work in a mm. way so it work becomes more similar to the characteristics we see during leisure time, perhaps mm. perhaps they could actually be become more healthier. 
by doing this type of work. So what we have uh, we are starting out doing now is um, we started out in childcare now doing a pilot study uh, where we did measurements. Uh, childcare workers, a lot of them have poor fitness, poor health. Measure the heart rate; they never get the heart rate up. They get plenty of, of recovery time. They are sitting a lot during the work. So what we try now is to develop some uh, some games for the children. Mm. with having the main purpose of getting the children more active uh, with the childcare workers as active role models. And then we developed some games uh, where it was feasible uh, or it required <laughs> it required the workers to get their heart rate up. So we did just a, a, a study now where we really found they can really get their heart rate up. So, so mm. um, as, And then as part of their work, and the children loves it, right? So in that way, you know, they are doing their work with high quality, getting the children more physically active, and they get their heart rate up. And in, the, in that respect, builds the fitness levels. So now we are trying in manufacturing workers, trying to see because a lot of them are standing. So we are measuring as, uh, on average uh, in the manufacturing sector in Denmark, we have been measuring uh, around 500 people. They are standing on average, I think it's five hours. Five mm. hours standing, and uh, and so and we, so we really try then to design uh, the work so they also can get some work tasks which breaks up the standing with walking, particularly walking. Mm. I think that's really important for this group, but also periods of sitting. So in trying to investigate if some of these work tasks can be done sitting, right? Mm. So we are trying to, and I think that's because if we can if, if we can design the work. Of all these low skilled, low paid manual groups, so they just get fitter and healthier by doing their physical activity at work. Mm. I think that then we will not be de- so depending on, you know, their motivation or resources or, or other things, right? Mm. So that's what we are currently doing. Yeah, really, really interesting and many points. If I go a little bit back to the slaughterhouse example that they are doing really physical upper body work and still it was beneficial that they are doing a training for their upper body, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so that's that's quite surprising, isn't it? That wouldn't you think naturally that they actually need recovery for their upper body because they have been doing this eight hour work shift probably and still it was beneficial that they are actually loading more was it that they were doing like kind of maximal style strength training that you have just few repetitions and maybe also what do you think is the mechanisms why recovery wasn't better but why was it better actually to load the body even more yeah so so um um the the exercise they were have, have been doing there is, is using elastic bands um so it's not you know it's not very very high load but it's quite it's try to make it you know 10 rep- repetitions max something like that mm. so try to make it quite high uh, but also try to do it in a way that is feasible to do this you know in principle on the production floor Right, mm. they don't have time to, to you know go out somewhere else for a fitness center or whatever. Um, but but uh, uh, with respect to the mechanisms, we don't know. I think one of the first things we see is that we see uh, uh, improved function and capacity. So one mechanism can be if you increase your capacity, then you will lower the relative load from doing the the, the work tasks. And in that way, you know, make it make the worker fit for the job, right? Mm. So then, so that's one way to do it, one way. Another, um, then it's been also, but that's just speculations. If it can be anything with blood flow or other kind of physiological mechanisms, when you're really stimulating your body, in you know, they are doing often. They are doing having a knife cutting. Uh, mm. And and you are having having to put quite lot lot of of pressure on the knife and quite monotonous, right? Mm. So of course, having a completely different movement with high in, higher intensity will completely break up, completely break up the that type of monotonous uh, activity. Mm. Uh, but I think in general it is that that uh, uh, 
many of these workers, we also see that when they come home, they are they are then quite sedentary for natural reasons because they're mm. so fatigued, right? So it might be that actually get get to the recovery they need. I don't know. I don't know this, but I guess it might be that they get the recovery they need after the work. Mm. So, but what they really need is also not only to have the lower dose; they also need to have the stimuli, mm. you know, for the for the body functions to 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 improve. Mm. Um, and this can be both, uh, you know, both muscular fitness and kind of res- respiratory fitness. Yeah. So, so could we say that we shouldn't promote any activity that that's healthy, but it's always about the balance between sitting, standing, low intensity activity, m- moderate intensity, and high intensity. That it's always a balance between these, and none of them is good by themselves. Yeah, I think it will be a massive shift in the physical activity field in the future. Uh, up to now, you know, it's been for, for several decades, it's been that we are taking one behavior at a time. You know, moderate to vigorous physical activity, that's good, right? Mm. Or sitting, that's bad. And now, you know, we are we are at a state, I think, where, where people are, are thinking about well, we need to shift one activity with the other, right? Mm. The isotemporal substitution modeling and these type of things. So if you if you shift out, if you go, if you shift out one hour sitting with uh, one hour walking, that gives this effect on uh, some kind of health effects. If you shift it out with uh, running, it gives a better effects, mm. right? But where I think we are going and where I think we need to go is that the body is influenced by all the things you do throughout the day. So you cannot just take one thing and, and just consider how it shifts out with the other. You need to say, this person, what is it actually doing throughout the day? Hmm. And what we are doing with this type of statistical models with the isotemporal substitution, what we normally do then is we just take the average of the population and then we shift from the average population one hour more or less on, on the behaviors, saying, hmm. what is the benefit benefits for exactly those being on the average. But that might be a completely different story for someone lying in the outer end, which might be, for instance, those being blue-collar workers. Mm. Because which ones, I don't know, any data sets in the world, cohort studies, having, uh, for instance, uh, hundreds of manufacturing workers standing for five to six hours. So we cannot say that while well, even though that we cannot say that while well, we have found that primarily among white color privileged workers that is good to replace uh, sitting with uh, walking. Mm. I don't think we can necessarily say well that also applies for a worker which in general are not sitting much but standing a lot. Mm. So I think that uh, at least that's what we are working a lot on now. We we need to we want to see what is the health effect of having all these behaviors throughout, throughout the day? Mm-hmm. And depending on what behaviors you are doing throughout the day, what would then be the best thing to do to, to generate an even better balance? And generating the balance might be very different from a manufacturing worker compared to us, right? We mm-hmm. need, we sitting here, of course we need MVPA, moderate vigorous physical activity, because we are sitting so much, so that makes perfectly sense for us to have a balance. But mm. for those being having the cleaners, slow walking for seven to eight hours, it's not necessarily the same, right? Mm. And then it's the question, how to make the balance for them, right? So I, th- I think it will be a complete, uh, and we, up to now we don't have the uh, analytical approach, we don't have the statistical approach. Uh, it's very few cohorts in the world which actually are having the data to really investigate this. And if we are able to investigate it, it's often for white-collar office workers. Mm. And then, of course, then we will just find one thing, sit less, move more, for sure. Yeah. I don't think that, I don't think we will find anything else. For me, I think it's not much novelty in that anymore. It's mm. more about those, those uh, lower socioeconomic groups, those high-risk groups in our society. Mm. What would be the balance for them? Yeah, and now the public health message is sit less, move more, or every step counts. 
it's basically every step counts if you are too sedentary. And still, some steps are better than others, right? Yeah, and I, I think that's. I think that's. First of all, I, I think it's a very, really good message in the way that it's simple, and I truly believe it's exactly the right message for the sedentary population, for those having sedentary jobs or not having a job, just being sedentary throughout the day, for sure. Uh, what I'm just saying is that is that we don't have data, at least as far as I've seen, we don't have documentation saying that this also applies for uh, uh, different occupational groups like slaughterhouse workers, manufacturing mm -hmm. workers, uh, but it could also be those having different type of service jobs, walking in, so those uh, working in restaurants, they also being on their feet a lot. Should we say the same to them? And that's one thing, and, and I think that's that's uh, looking in uh, on, on Nordic countries and looking into those having those low skill, low paid jobs. But I also think uh, internationally, I think we really need to consider um, the take on this because now you know we are saying which countries in the world are the best on physical activity. Mm. I think the based on the. The uh, the last uh, last investigation of that, it I think the, the, the country which coming best out was Uganda. All right. What do you think is the life expectancy in Uganda compared to some of these those countries coming out as the worst with respect to physical activity? The, yeah. Those coming out as the worst, it's it's us. You know, it's yeah. a high income. Uh, you know. Uh, highly developed uh, societies. And I, I think what, uh, when we're thinking about, also if you're putting this into a historic perspective, often when we are said that, well, it, it's actually the, those having a lot of resources, those having high income, those in the upper class, they are actually having their issues. Hmm. I'm in doubt. And, because, and, and of course, everyone understands that what, what's the reasoning for for the low and middle income countries having more physical activity is because they have a manual jobs, right? Mm. Yeah. So, so I, th I think that, that this is something which really, and, and it's just so important for the messaging, so important for what to prioritize. I also think it's so important to be able to, be able to reach out to those lower socioeconomic groups um, and these, these countries which are not having the same level of, of uh, you know, industrial production and automatic production as, as we have. Hmm. So researchers as white collar workers privileged have problems seeing the things from the perspective of actually manual workers from blue collar perspective and all the data comes from white collar. So we probably need to change and widen our perspective a little bit in the research and i think this is this is an important message that you are you are telling yeah thanks so so i, I just think it's um sometimes i i ask you know how many of uh, us researchers have been out at the slaughterhouse production how many has actually been out at a manufacturing site and and looked themselves how it's really how, how this how, how is the production really? Because I mm. think a lot of us have, have in mind that well, they are just sitting. They are just sitting in manufacturing. Well, I think the, the manufacturing uh, work sites in Denmark is as high, highly tech developed as any in the world, I think, and having a really good work environment. But they are, they are standing a lot. Mm. Um, so so I, th I, think we, I think we need particularly... If us researchers, and I think a lot of us really want one thing, we want to improve health for the entire population, and we know we want to reduce socioeconomic differences. Hmm. I haven't met anyone in our field who just says, no, that's not my aim. I think all of us want that, right? And then I just think that it's so important that we not only are being experts and giving optimal advices, recommendations, and interventions for white-collar uh, privileged workers. We mm. should do it 
we should do it for the cleaners, for the manufacturing workers, for the construction workers, all those dying several years before office workers. Hmm. Really important, important points. And I, I think really, really relevant. Let's see when we will have the recommendations which actually take the point of view for for different people that they are speci- specific guidelines for different occupational groups or or so on. One one thing that came to my mind in the beginning that you said that even like some some overhead work or cleaning windows, for example, it increases the blood pressure and is maybe causing cardiovascular diseases. Could this be also reason in the office work that if you have a bad ergonomics and you are tensing your upper body too much, that it could be the same system of increasing the blood pressure a tiny bit for a long duration? Uh. My short answer would be no. So again, you know, uh, um, I don't know if 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 it's because, of, of course, for our, our, us being researchers, or those sitting in the funding bodies or in the research councils, they are having white collar knowledge work, right? So we are we we have ease of understanding that while it might be it, it might be a little a little bit troublesome to be sitting here all day, right? It might mm. actually increase the heart, the blood pressure, whatever. Yeah. Forget about it. Compared yeah. to, I would just say, uh, to those who are thinking that, while well, we should just make even better ergonomics for us office workers, I would just say, come out. I invite you to Denmark. Come out and uh, and join me for uh, f- for the slaughterhouse workers or those having real work not having the same amount of control. We can sit, most of our office workers, at least in Nordic countries, right? We have sit-stand stations. We have a high level of control influence, right? We can do our work lying down if we want to, <laughs> particularly during this situation, right? And still yeah. we are, and still, you know, still we are thinking about those having the same type of work as we have. And I haven't checked it. But I guess that still it's been performed much more, more randomized controlled trials for office workers, often highly educated office workers, lifetime expectancy in Nordic countries of, I don't know, 90 or something. Mm. I don't think you can find that many randomized controlled yeah. trials in the, in the other groups. Yeah. And I think that's what we need. And I think that's, but, but of course it's so, if you, we don't, uh, at least before I started in the occupational health field, I was out in s- sports clubs and uh, talking with the same people with the same level of education and those living in the same nice neighborhoods in, in the city, right? So I, I think we just, I just think that uh, we need, you also mentioned the, ab- about the guidelines. Hmm. Of course, we cannot, we should not make guidelines without having the evidence. What we should do, I think, is to collaborate to be able to have the good data sets on these type of occupational groups or, or, or populations in general, so we can actually build the same level of evidence as we have now for sedentary workers. So that's that's what that's in principle my dream. So I think and, and it is that we should we should collaborate more between those being from occupational health and public health to going out to those type of occupational groups and make sure that if we are if we are uh, generating new cohorts we should really be sure that we should not have overrepresented white collar knowledge workers we should have overrepresented the other ones mm. the lower socioeconomic groups yeah, makes sense. Uh, we have discussed now 45 minutes, so I think we should wrap up the first part. It has been really interesting points and perspectives and a lot to learn for, for many researchers. Is there any final remarks you would like to say about the physical activity paradox before we finish this this part? Yeah, so in, in principle, it's just two things. I think at least. The first thing is, 
we need to collaborate more to get the data and the studies so we can we can go from being some kind of religion to have evidence. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, um, I I don't think we should. Of course, it's been in the occupational field. It's been so many years of trying to reduce risks of having manual work. Forest workers in Finland, you have a long tradition on that, reducing risks, right? Hmm. But I think we should go beyond that. We should try to make those type of manual work health promoting. Hmm. So those being working with the elderly. Those working, having those type of, and it's, at least in Denmark, it's about one third of the population. One third of adult population are having this type of, some kind of manual, not necessarily very hard manual, but some kind of manual jobs. We should try to make all of the, them benef- health beneficial. So they remind of all the beneficial characteristics, which we know so well from leisure time facilitivity. Hmm. I think that's, that's the two main things. Yeah. Great point. So thank you, Andreas, for taking the time for this recording. Thanks. It's a pleasure.